Hello, we welcome you to our service today. The sermon this morning is titled, Behave Like a Christian. The text is based on Romans 12, verses 8 to 21. If you'd like to follow along with our study today as we look at three points in this text, please turn to Romans 12, 8 to 21. Paul beseeched his brethren to present themselves acceptable to God, which he said was their reasonable service. Instead of being conformed to this world, he exhorted them to be transformed in mind that they would prove by their conduct this acceptable will of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the will of God? concerning our conduct today as Christians. In this passage, he describes how they ought to present themselves acceptable to God. Brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, he says, which is your reasonable service, your rational service. What is rational for us to do today as Christians in our service of the Lord. Be not conformed to this world, he says, be conformed to God, be transformed by the word of God that you may follow his acceptable will today. Paul described the church metaphorically as the body of Christ. He looked at the church as though it were a body. And with any body, there are members. The head of the body is Jesus Christ. The members of the body are Christians. As members, they serve together in the body with different functions. Verse 5, he concluded, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And so he looks at the various functions of the church in his day and he ends by exhorting his brethren to behave like Christians. Good advice, good exhortation for us today as well. As a member of the body of Christ, behave like a Christian. And so the final section here describes what conduct is acceptable for members. Acceptable to who? Acceptable, pleasing to God. The general theme of this section is that they get along with one another. And so many of the exhortations found here deal with that theme. Our first point today, be loving. And so behave like Christians, be loving. Verses 9 to 13. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly and affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Be loving. So if you are to behave as a Christian, be loving. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. What does it mean? What does Paul mean by let love be without hypocrisy? Here's the idea of love being genuine or sincere. Rather than hiding, under a false appearance of love, 
He says, your love as Christians ought to be genuine. Your love as Christians ought to be sincere. And so do not act with dissimulation or hypocrisy. The idea of hiding under a false appearance. The hypocrite was, was the actor. And in this case, he did not want them to serve as actors. He wanted them to be sincere and genuine in their conduct, conduct which was governed by, according to the will of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8, Paul discusses various characteristics of love. We've studied this in the past. Basically, we see how that he gives a more excellent way, the way of love, and he points out the selflessness of love. Love is not selfish. Love is altruistic. Love thinks of others, not only its own interest, but the interest of others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not self selfish. Love is concerned with the well-being, not only of self, but of others. He said, let love be without hypocrisy. That is, let love be genuine. Let love be sincere. And lay aside all hypocrisy. First Peter chapter 2, and one, verse 1. He says, abhor what is evil. The word abhor is a rather strong word for hate. Perhaps if we regarded evil with extreme repugnance, there would be less evil in the world today. Certainly, we would be less tempted to commit evil if we were abhorrent of evil, if we hated evil, and there would be less of it in the world. The scriptures teach, such as in Psalm 97, verse 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. And in Proverbs 8 and 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And so if we are to be wise, according to the teaching of Solomon and David, then we would hate evil. We would love the Lord, we would hate evil, revering him and his will. He says, cling or cleave to what is good. Again, perhaps if we held to what is good, there would be less evil in the world and there would be more of what is good, of what we hold dear, and these things would be practiced in the world today. And so, abhor evil, cling, cleave to what is good. And so the idea here of being fast, something like uh, being glued to what is good, that we're not going to let it go. We're not going to give it up. And so, so while we abhor evil, we're cleaving, we're clinging to what is good. Again, the scriptures teach in the Old Testament, Amos 5 and 15, hate evil, love good. And in the New Testament scriptures, we see in Hebrews 1 and 9, where the Father says to the Son, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness or iniquity. And so let's follow the example of God as Christians. Romans 10 and verse Romans 12 and verse 10, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Christians should care for one another. And so if we are to behave as Christians, we ought to care for one another in a similar way as members of family care for one another. One version reads, Love one another with brotherly affection. Hebrews 13 and 1, let brotherly love continue. And in 1 Peter 2 and 17, Peter wrote, love the brotherhood. And in chapter 3 and verse 8, love as brothers. And so as members of the body, the church of Jesus Christ, Christians, we may not be actual brothers, but we are brothers in Christ. And so love in a similar way as family would love family as being a part of the family of Christ, love one another, have similar concern for each other. He says, in honor, giving preference to one another. Who do we prefer? Who do we prefer to associate with? 
we ought to take delight in honoring each other, often putting the interests of others ahead of ourselves. One version reads, outdo one another in showing honor. Philippians 2 and verse 3, Paul wrote, let each esteem others better than himself. And in 1 Peter 2 and 17, Peter wrote, honor all, honor all people. Verse 11, he says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence or not slothful in business. Diligence is defined by Merriam-Webster as steady, earnest, and energetic effort. And so not lagging in your effort, your energetic effort in serving Christ as Christians. Behave as Christians. And so put forth the energy. Sometimes people are lazy. Rather than being slothful, he's saying be diligent. Hebrews 4 and verse 11, he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. What rest is he talking about in Hebrews 4 and 11? The rest of heaven, the rest of the faithful. He says, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And so we see that unfaithfulness and disobedience can keep one from that rest. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them, of those who diligently seek him. And so put away the slothfulness in the businesses as Christians, and put on diligence in your service of the Lord, and your relation to one another as members of the body of Christ, as Christians. How should we behave toward one another? Behave as Christians? Paul gives us some of those exhortations here in this chapter. He says, fervent in spirit. Uh, we might say that in, in heart. Their spirit was marked by great intensity of feeling. And so they were exhorted to keep their spiritual fervor. As a preacher, a man named Apollos was said to be fervent in spirit in Acts 18 and 25. And so they were called to enthusiastically serve the Lord. It wasn't a matter of cutting corners or doing the least amount possible, knowing just how much do I have to do. Sometimes that's the attitude that, that people have today. Here he's calling for their enthusiastic service in the work of the Lord. And whatever you do, Colossians 3.23, he says, and whatever you do, do it heartedly. That is, do it with all your heart. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So as Christians, behave like Christians, we need to know who we serve. As Christians, we serve Christ. And so do the things that are pleasing to him. Whatever you do, he says, do it heartily as to the Lord. We're not doing it because it's expected of us by, by people. We do it because it's expected of us by God, because it is the right thing to do. We do. Verse 11, he says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And so putting forth our efforts in service of him. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. And why do we do these things? Because we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're called to love our neighbor as ourself. Rejoicing in hope. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, right to the end of life. What is that hope? The hope of heaven. It's not that we want life to be over with in this world. It's that we have that rejoicing of the hope right up to the end. We hope to be with the Lord. We have those promises given to us by God in the scriptures. Luke 10 and 20, he says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's what the Lord told his disciples. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, 
Paul described various ones, and he's described the unity of the faith, the body of Christ, and he says there is one hope of your calling. Colossians 1 and verse 5, he says, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16, he says, rejoice always. There's always reason to rejoice as Christians. And so behave as Christians. There are times that Christians are sad. and There's times that Christians are glad. But when he calls for them to behave as Christians, as members of the body of Christ, he's, he's reminding them of their hope. That hope that they ought to hold fast to right up to the end. Rejoice always. Paul could rejoice even from bonds, even from chains. Philippians chapter 4 and 4, this letter of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul said. Patient in tribulation. It's interesting that we go from rejoicing and hope to being patient in tribulation. Yes, there are reasons to rejoice, and those reasons to rejoice include our hope of heaven. That helps us to persevere through times of trouble. And so be patient in tribulation. They were to be patient in distress or the sufferings resulting from oppression or persecution, whatever it may have been. Paul often was persecuted for the faith. Luke chapter 21 and 19, Jesus said, by your patience, possess your souls. James 5, 10 to 11 speaks of Job in the Old Testament. If you've studied the book of Job, then you know that the lesson of Job is the lesson of patience or perseverance. You have heard of the perseverance of Job. Yes, most people have. I, I hope have heard of the patience of Job. Here was a man who lost pretty much everything except his faith in the Lord. He held to his integrity. And while he said some things that were wrong, you know, he did some things that were, were wrong, we see that ultimately he held to his integrity. He maintained faith. He didn't know why things were happening, but he continued and he persevered. And in the end, the Lord blessed him. Patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly or instant in prayer. Here's the idea of being devoted to God in prayer. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, he said, men ought to always pray and not to lose heart. Sometimes we become discouraged by what we see around in the world or perhaps by the tribulation that we might face. But Paul told, Jesus told the disciples not to lose heart, to continue to pray. Colossians 4 and 2, Paul wrote, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. There are reasons to be thankful. Often in the news, the only news you see is bad news. But there is plenty of good news. And as Christians, we believe in the good news, the gospel of Christ. That Jesus died for our sins. The good news is, is that by his sacrifice, which he offered willingly, his life, we are redeemed from our sins. And so as we believe and obey the gospel, our sins are forgiven. We are enter into this relationship with the Lord. We are part of his family, and we have the promise of the inheritance, that hope of heaven. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. There are also other passages that we could list, but I think you see the need for prayer. This passage of verses 9 to 13 deals with love. Love for one another, yes, love for ourself is included in loving one another as we love ourself, as Jesus gave a commandment. But this love of God, and because we love him, we keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so here, this love motivates them to continue to persevere, to trust, and hope, and to continue to pray to the Lord. Verse 13, love. He says, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. And so as Christians, we behave as Christians in that we love 
Here, he gives an example, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, just one of many examples of exercising love in the lives of others. Distributing to the needs or to the necessity of the saints. And so the saints, members of the body of Christ, as we read earlier, Christians. Therefore, Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so as Christians, members of the body of Christ, we're part of the household of faith. We're part of the family of, of Christ. And so we do good to all, to all people, but especially to those people, those members of the body of Christ. And so we see love. And so when we see the need to behave as Christians, then certainly love is a key component. Hebrews 13 and 6, he says, but do not forget to do good and share, to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. In the beginning of Romans chapter 12, Paul describes how that we ought to present ourselves as living sacrifices. He says, and do not be conformed to this world. Verse 1, he says, that you may present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, in this passage, he, in Hebrews 13 and 16, he talks about the needs to do good and to share and describes these as being sacrifices that God is well pleased with. Last, he says, given to hospitality. People can be given to any number of things, and sometimes they're given to things that are wrong. In this case, given to something that is good. Practicing hospitality. Hospitality is defined by Thayer as literally love of strangers, love to strangers. First Peter chapter four and nine, he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Sometimes we grumble when we are called to do good. Here, Peter advises them to be hospitable, to love one another, even strangers, without grumbling, complaining. Hebrews 13 and 2, talking of hospitality, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And so here we see uh, an allusion um, of the writer to the book of the Old Testament, where we see Abraham entertaining strangers with Sarah. And so as Christians, we are called to be loving, behave as Christians, do the things that you see here. Second, not only be loving, but be kind, verses 14 to 16. Verse 14, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless, and do not curse. As Christians, we trust God, and we leave the judgment of others to him. As God, he will judge. And so, as Christians, and behaving as Christians, leave the judgment to him. Don't take it into your own hands. Matthew chapter 5, 43 to 45, Jesus teaches the lesson, bless those who curse you. And so Paul here is teaching the same lesson taught by his master, by Lord Jesus Christ. As you read that passage, you note his teaching on love, but also on kindness toward, toward others. Perhaps a natural response as taught by the world would be that if someone cursed you, you curse them. If someone one was to persecute you, you were to persecute them. But love is a higher calling. And here we see the calling of Christ as taught by Paul, blessing those who would even persecute you. Earlier, he talks about the need to persevere in faith and prayer, right up firm to the end. But here in this life, rather than cursing others when they do us harm or say things of this nature, he says, bless, rather than curse. James 3 and 10, James said, out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Sometimes, sometimes brethren say things that, that ought not to be so. 
That's true of everybody, of course. Uh, James talks about the need to bridle our tongue. Sometimes people harm us, we curse them. We ought not to do this. Behave as Christians. And so to behave as Christians is to follow the teaching of Christ. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. This was an expression of sympathy, of sharing the feelings of another. The first part of the passage, rejoice with those who rejoice, rather than feeling envy or jealousy for someone else, Instead, honor them, rejoice with them, be glad with them of their advantage, rather than wanting that same advantage for your own. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. The second part of this especially, sharing the feelings of others, perhaps those who are sad, or perhaps who are in sorrow, maybe because of tribulation or persecution. And so sharing with them and their feelings, rather than putting them down, being a shoulder to lean on, being a hand to lift them up, to hold them, to carry them, helping them in whatever way we can. The kind word, the words of encouragement in times that are, are scary. Sometimes this world can be a scary place. You watch the news, you see all that's going on in this world around us. But we can make this world a better place as we follow the teachings of Christ. If more people would do so, if more people would follow what we see here in this chapter, this world would indeed be a better place to live, to raise families, to be neighbors, to work with one another, to live amongst one another. Do what you can to follow his teaching. Do what you can as depends on you. First Corinthians 12, 26, Paul says, in reference to the church, the body of Christ, he says, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so here you have the picture of various members of a body, in this case, the church, with the members of the church either rejoicing with the other members or, or feeling sorrow or suffering in some way with the other members. And so you see the, the sympathy. The, the sharing of feelings with, with one another. It's not a picture of condemnation, it's a picture of encouragement, of sympathy, of empathy with one another. Verse 16, he says, be of the same mind toward one another. Here's a picture of humbleness. He says, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And so be of the same mind toward one another. One version reads, live in harmony with one another. As Christians, we share a common faith. We believe in Christ as the Son of God. And so we resolve to follow his teachings. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, he says, be perfectly joined together in the same mind. And in Philippians 3 and 16, he says, let us be of the same mind. Do not set your mind on high things, or mind not high things. Associate with the humble. And so the picture here is not being haughty, not being arrogant, but willingly associating with the, with the lowly, with the humble, as we are humble ourselves. Verse 3, Paul taught earlier not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly and so seriously about these matters, carefully, considerately. We ought to be more considerate with other people. Rather than thinking of our own selves all the time, we ought to also think of other people too. Romans 2 and 11, Paul taught, for there is no partiality with God. And in James 2, 1 to 4, James taught the lesson that showing partiality is wrong. And so we ought to treat people fairly, especially in the body of Christ. Behave as Christians also means being kind is to be fair. Do not be wise in your own opinions or do not be wise in your own conceits, your own sight, your own estimation. 
Sometimes people think far too much of themselves than what is warranted, than what is reasonable. Romans 11 and 25, he says, lest you should be wise in your own opinions. And so there is the danger. Galatians 5 and 26, he says, let us not be conceited or become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so instead, as Christians, to behave as Christians is not only to love, but is to be kind. Verses 17 to 20, the third point today, is that as Christians, we are called to be peaceable. Verses 17 to 20. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And so repay or recompense no one evil for evil. Jesus in Matthew 5, 38 to 39, spoke against personal retaliation. He taught people to turn the other cheek. That's what the lesson's all about. He's teaching against, personally retaliating against others. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, he says, See that no one renders evil to evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself, yourselves, and for all. And so it's not just about us, but about other people too. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, knowing that you were called to this. And so on the contrary, a blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And so we were called not to curse, but to bless, to be a blessing to others. Oh, how much better this world would be if more people would follow this teaching. He says, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And so the idea here of giving thought to what is honorable. Second Corinthians 8 and 21, Paul wrote, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Sometimes people do things that are good only when people are watching. They, they do what they're supposed to do when people see. But as Christians, to behave as Christians, we ought to do good whether we think anybody sees or not. We ought to trust, have faith that God sees to have that confidence. Proverbs 3, 4, Solomon, the wise king, wrote, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Romans 12 and verse 18, Paul wrote, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Granted, it is not always possible to live peaceably with all people. There are some people that will not have peace. You may do your best to be peaceable, but there are others perhaps who will not entertain peace. He says, if it is possible, so as much as depends on you, as much as lies on you, live peaceably in the sight of all people. Live peaceably with all people, all men. James 3 and 17, he says, but wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. And so if we are wise, show that we're wise by our conduct, live a pure and peaceable life. Matthew 5 and 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This world needs more peacemakers rather than troublemakers. I think we could all agree that that is true. The world would be better off with more peacemakers. Romans 12 and 19, as Christians, we're called to behave as Christians and to set an example. He says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so the lesson here is not to seek personal vengeance, to avenge ourselves personally, but to leave it to the wrath of God, leave it to God in his justice and his judgment. The scriptures of the Old Testament taught this in Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36, vengeance is mine and recompense, says the Lord. Verse 36, for the Lord will judge his people. So leave that to God. Hebrews 10, 30 quotes from this passage, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. And so let's leave judgment to God. Passages like Romans 1.18 and others, Ephesians 5.6, Colossians 
teach that the wrath of God is against sin, the practice of sin. Verse 20, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep coals of fire on his head. Paul quoted from Solomon in the book of Proverbs. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap fire, coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Paul may intend for the figure of coals of fire to represent the judgment of God, the recompense of the Lord. How he says in verse 20, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Some have also suggested that perhaps lovingly doing good may lead to, to those who would do wrong to feel bad about what they have done, for their conscience to trouble them. That's possible. In the context, I, I think that he's speaking here of leaving the judgment to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 21, he concludes. He sums up the entire exhortation to behave as Christians. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. A.T. Robertson in his commentary wrote, Stop being conquered by evil, but keep on conquering the evil in the good. As much as we conform to this world, we are overcome by evil. Yet as much as we transform ourselves to the will of God, we overcome evil. This lesson's taught in the beginning of the chapter, Romans chapter 12 in verse 2. And now concludes with verse 21. What does it mean to behave like a Christian? Romans 12 describes things that are acceptable to God, which ought to characterize the behavior of members of the body of Christ. As much as we conform to this world, we are overcome by evil. Let's not let that happen. Instead, let's transform ourselves to the will of God. And in so doing, we will overcome evil. Today, we hope that you have been blessed by the sermon this morning and that you would learn from Romans chapter 12 in how to behave as a Christian. This passage is not exhaustive. There's much to learn from the scriptures, especially from the New Testament scriptures. But we learn in verses 9 to 13 to be loving, and in verse 14 to 16 to be kind, and in verses 17 to 20 to be peaceable. If you're not yet a Christian, then we would encourage you to think about becoming one. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and because of your faith, you're willing to confess your faith in him, repent of your sins, and be baptized, then we encourage you to do so. If you already are a Christian, perhaps you have not been behaving as a Christian, should behave, then we would encourage you to repent and go to God in prayer. God will forgive you, and certainly you ought to forgive yourself. You repent of your sins, turn and follow him. We hope that you will learn from what Paul has written to the Romans and would apply it in your life today. We pray that God would bless you as you serve him. Until next time.